New York, where the strangest characters fill the sidewalks, concealing surprising private lives. One might think these are pets on their morning stroll, but actually they are some of New York's most famous models on their way to a fashion shoot. William Wegman, a world-renowned artist, has made dogs the focus of his art and life. Yeah, that's good. Stay looking over there. Wegman sees his dogs as partners. They create art that's unique and universal, with enormous public appeal. He's doing great with all this stuff on. I like him a lot better. Wegman's models are Weimaraners, originally bred in Germany for hunting. Over the years, Wegman has worked with a series of these statuesque dogs. But one model stood out. A model who left behind an amazing artistic legacy, Faye Ray. One of the most photographed dogs in history. Faye inspired Wegman with her majestic presence, her sleek, long body, and her magnetic stare. They had the most intense expression of any of the dogs. A caster is uh, somebody obsessed, someone uh, intense, and never someone blasé or, or lazy. Far from lazy, Faye was a hard-working actress who played a thousand roles. She looked imposing rather than silly, I thought. And she became these um, crazy-looking characters that I equated more to uh, mythology than to you know, doggy art. <laughs> but Wegman's fascination with dogs did not begin with Faye. It began with Man Ray, a present the young Wegman received in 1970 when he was a painter in California. The dog was just another household thing, and I incorporated this, this thing much as, as I would my ordinary props until his personality started to sneak in and bring me out into a whole other place. Man Ray starred in hundreds of Wegman's pieces, from photographs to quirky art videos. But the art sprang from a special relationship and that relationship would not last forever. You know, when Man Ray died after 12 years, I didn't run out and get another dog to replace him. In fact, I thought that was the end. And that was a complete body of work, no need to continue. And I was happily doing other work. There were no dogs in Wegman's art or Wegman's life for the next five years. But then, a breeder of Weimaraners invited Wegman to visit. The dogs vied for his attention. But one special dog caught his eye and wouldn't let go. Faye Ray. Wegman didn't want another dog, but he gave in, deciding to keep Faye as just a pet. And then I had to figure out what to do with her. Playing ball and lying around my house wasn't enough for her. She needed something else. Perhaps Faye needed a photographer's rapt attention. Those first shots in the backyard were magical. And once we started and I allowed myself to take her picture, then I uh, really released something in myself. I became a much happier person. And she certainly became powerful and uh, loomed much larger in, in my eyes and in her own eyes, I think. Faye became a canine Mona Lisa. She fired Wegman's imagination and reignited an old spark he thought was gone forever. What struck Wegman was Faye's desire to pose. No setup seemed too difficult. She had a sense of pride in her work, and she liked it to be kind of challenging. 
And if it was hard, people would go, wow, did you see that? Uh, she got excited about that. And as time went by, the setups got more elaborate and theatrical. Her real career uh, emerged, and she became more well-known than Man Ray as an artist model. She was more like a, a, a fashion figure in a way, because, well, most remarkably, I made her tall. Faye was an exceptionally sleek Weimaraner. Sitting on a high stool, wearing a long gown, she seemed ready for the runway. The fantasy became all the more real when Faye got a helping hand. Two helping hands, to be exact. It was a chance discovery. My assistant Andrea was talking to me and she was protecting Faye and it seemed like her hands were connected as she was gesturing. It seemed like Faye was actually talking and it was just so overwhelming, the illusion. That really made the, uh, the inspiration for these characters. The illusion does have its critics. Wegman knows that some people feel uneasy about all that dressing and posing of his dogs. I never started as a hobby. I never dressed up a dog uh, for fun. It was always done as art and for art. So it is a professional quest. And the dogs seem to thrive on it. They enjoy their wacky but wonderful jobs. You know, I know that I'm doing something for the dogs that they need. They need to do something <laughs> or else they'll eat your furniture and become pretty unruly, unhappy. So I give them jobs to do. I give them uh, roles to play. With Faye's star quality, Wegman was able to broaden his canvas, adding more dogs to the cast. He could make up characters, stories, full dramas. His work took a new turn. Okay, so that really changed everything, because then I had multiple dogs and lots of personalities at once. The personalities seemed to appeal as much to adults as to children. There were videos and storybooks. There were fairy stories, classic stories, bedtime stories. But Faye was still the star. Faye presents, da 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 da, Alphabet Soup. Do you know the alphabet? Every letter from A to Z? Faye does. Faye is very intelligent. A. The letter A. A, as in artist. Batty is an artist. She loves art. What's Faye doing? Faye's balancing a green apple on her head. Oops. Oh, great. There goes the green apple. Occasionally, Wegman's sunny fantasies gave way to darker tales. Well, sort of. The artist found that when it came to heavy drama, Faye was especially well suited. Hello. We're, We're the, the Hartley, Hartley boys. boys. They have the most intense expression of any of the dogs, but so intense that she looked kind of evil sometimes. She looked psychotic. In the Hartley Boys movie, I cast her as uh, an older woman. I cast her as a psychotic nurse. So she played those kind of roles. Here, take this key. It's to the back gate. Don't lose it. Should I use the front gate or the back gate? The back gate. What was that? What was that? Outside. Outside. Run, run. Please, boys, hurry. You must get to the sewage treatment plant. Close the valve. Hurry. Happy holidays, and welcome to Faye's house and Faye's 12 days of Christmas. Faye's photographs and videos developed a cult following in the art world, and they became huge mainstream bestsellers. The recipe called for eight eggs. But for Wegman, Faye was much more than his leading lady. 
she was part of Wegman's life outside the studio. Part of his family. A perfect friend for those endless summer days. But summer fades, and once again, tragedy struck. There was nothing really wrong with her. One day she stumbled, she wouldn't eat, brought her to the vet, and the vet said she had two weeks to live. To Wegman, the vet's diagnosis seemed incredible. She was so strong, I thought for sure she would beat that. You know, all other dogs might die of leukemia, but, you know, Faye would not, certainly, but she did. On June 7th, 1995, Faye Ray died. She was 10 years old. For Wegman, the best way to cope with the loss was to write about it. And I wrote hundreds of pages and didn't really want to stop writing about her. And I was very sad to finish the book. But, you know, just thinking about her, I think, helped too. And I get letters from so many people all over the place saying that, uh, but they just want to share that they understand how I felt. Faye's legacy includes more than books, photos, and memories. She had seven children. Later, there were grandchildren, too. Wegman raised many of them. Not surprisingly, when it came to art, several of the dogs have turned out to be chips off the old block. Maybe we'll try Chippy up in his character, and um, if he's like he always is, he'll almost go to sleep on us. With Chippy and Chundo and Crookie and Batty, the show still goes on. Faye's descendants no, haven't quite hey, replaced the one model that consumed Wegman for an entire yeah, decade. You're right. That was, uh, but each time he poses another character uh -huh. and snaps he another photo, something. Wegman oh, glimpses God. a little bit of Faye. coast of New Brunswick, a part of Canada that makes its living from the sea. Illegal fishing or poaching is a direct threat to the livelihoods of the people in this area. Fortunately, they have a clever and skillful protector. Jake works with John Stewart, an officer for Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Jake and John are constantly on the lookout for evidence of illegal fishing. Jake's determination and powerful sense of smell allows him to track poachers from the water's edge through any kind of terrain, secure the evidence, run the poachers down, and make an arrest. But Jake's more than just a police dog. He's a traveling spokesperson for John's work. I do a lot of community service or PR work, I guess, with the dog, especially the school programs, Cubs. When it comes to a police dog, they just are in awe. And it makes it stick in their minds, I guess. They remember the police dog, and then they also remember what we were talking about. Oh, that dog is used to help protect the environment, or fish, or, or the resources. How can you tell the difference between the two? 
John tells the kids about threats to their local ecology. But of course, all they want to hear about is how Jake catches the bad guys. Or bad guys that do things illegally and stealing the resort. Jake has been on the job for six years now. But one of his toughest cases came when he was just a rookie. Store owner Dennis Moss remembers. 3.30 in the afternoon on a Thursday, uh, two men entered our store wearing masks and, and carrying a sawed-off shotgun. They took uh, my general manager to the cash register and, and held the shotgun on him and, and made him give him the money. As soon as they had left, he called the police. Fortunately for Moss, the closest police unit was the team of Jake and John. This was bad news for the thieves. John and Jake were in the area, so the pursuit of, of them happened very rapidly. Uh, they actually uh, pursued him into some bushes, and uh, John uh, and Jake, they uh, captured and recovered uh, all of the money except for uh, just a few cents. So. Uh, so that was his first major bust, if what we call it sometimes, and uh, he made a name for himself right then and there. Uh, and everything started going from there. He bonded really quick with me, and I bonded with him really quick because we both had a natural, how would you call it, uh, affection for each other. It was love at first sight, that's what it comes down to, I guess. It won't be too long before Jake will have to retire from active duty. John and trainer Al Cox are already looking for a dog to replace him. But Jake's not an easy act to follow. By doing this, we try to see if they're inquisitive enough to, to follow it and, and discover and chase. They want to find out what's around the corner. You don't want an overly aggressive dog because they're quite a, quite a handicap in the resource protection, law enforcement end of things. And you don't want a dog that's too shy and won't protect his master. Middle of the road is great. You mark one and you visit them every four or five days to see if the decision is right. But until his replacement is found and trained, Jake will stay on the job by land, sea, and even in the air. Jake has become a prized member of this community. Every month, like clockwork, Jake and John pick up a grateful Dennis Moss's reward for Jake's detective work six years ago. Moss has pledged to provide Jake's food for the rest of his life. Mark it on the calendar. Got a bag right around yep. here. Although Jake will be retiring from police work, John has no intention of splitting up a partnership that's so deep and that's lasted so long. I think he'll adjust to retirement pretty easy because he knows he's loved and he also knows that he's in his home area. That he will be with me until he dies. That's just the way it is. I have to kind of say that, that, uh, that he's my partner and he'll be my partner to the end. Everybody, parents, teachers, and kids, wants a safe, drug-free school and they want to avoid problems before they develop. They need a deterrent, but one that won't terrorize the students or infringe on their rights. The answer, Toby, a two-year-old yellow lab. Toby has been training to be a sniffer dog for more than a year. Today is Toby's first day at Chaminade High School. It's also his first day with a new handler, Joe Austin. Toby has been trained to associate the scent of drugs, firearms, or explosives with the scent of his favorite toy. This may be serious business, but for Toby, 
it's all a game. Find the contraband, find the toy. He's looking for something in each one of those book bags, each one of those lockers. Hopefully Toby will find his toy in there. And he will work eight hours a day, 10 hours a day to find that toy. He's playing hide and seek. You're kind of making him guess, where did Joe put my toy today? It's very rare for Toby, or any sniffer dog, to find drugs or weapons. So to keep him fresh and intense, Joe plants a drug-scented envelope. And then, behind a pile of old National Geographics, Toby hits pay dirt. On a successful find, Toby's trained to do a passive alert, to sit quietly and wait for his trainer to find the scent and cough up the toy. Good boy, what'd you get, huh? What'd you get? And another funny thing that he'll do is uh, when it is a, an odor that, that uh, he is trained on, I uh, notice he actually starts drooling quite a bit waiting for that toy. Toby is the latest in a line of dogs brought to the school by Joe's security service. Students have seen other dogs sniff out planted items. They've heard about weapons occasionally found in other schools. And most importantly, they never know when he'll visit. Hey, you guys need to leave all your stuff where it is. The only thing that you can take with you is what you have on your person. Toby's surprise visit didn't turn up anything illegal, and that's just what everyone wants. Using him as a deterrent is working for this school. And Joe's pleased with Toby, too. Although there is a bit more training in Toby's future. Uh, ultimately, that would be what I would wish for him to have a little bit more right now, is a little bit more obedience, a little bit better manners, basically. Uh, but sniffing, his drive, as far as a working dog, I couldn't ask for anything better at this point. And I think Toby's going to have a long, long career with us.